I want to welcome everyone to His Glory Ministry as we continue our series in the book of Mark. Today we will be, and tonight uh, we'll be in Mark 2. Uh, people always ask me, why do you come on and say, um, when it's, it's in the morning or afternoon, why do you say, uh, tonight you're, you're broadcasting that? Because uh, His Glory Ministry is, is in literally in every country in the world today, and the majority of our followers it is nighttime all over the Middle East and uh, throughout the nation. So that's why I say night, it's night for them, maybe uh, morning for some of us, and it may be uh, afternoon for others. So we invite all of you all over His Glory Nation, all 350,000 and growing uh, massively every day. Praise the Lord. It's all for the glory of our Most High God and through His Son, Jesus Christ. We, uh, as we always do before we start these uh, Bible sessions, we want to invite the Holy Spirit. We invite the Holy Spirit from east to west to north to south to be the true teacher in the living Word of God, which is Christ our Lord. Okay, so that's why we bring in the Holy Spirit. I am not a teacher of God's, uh, even though I'm a pastor, I'm not a teacher of God's Word. Only the Holy Spirit can teach us so that when we go into the Scripture, we need to go into the Scripture with an open heart and our heart towards the Lord. And as Paul said in uh, Acts 17, 11, um, we, we, we take the scripture in with an open heart, but we check the scripture ourselves daily to make sure it is true. Okay, with that said, we've got the Holy Spirit with us. Let's start into Mark 2. And again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. So Jesus is going to Capernaum, I, I, they found the synagogue uh, that is still there. When I was in Israel, I actually was uh, outside of this synagogue. This is, uh, it was just the, the rock rubbles around the base of the particular uh, area where Jesus uh, taught. But it's, it's very neat, uh, nevertheless, because we, you get an opportunity to see exactly where Jesus taught from, and it, it makes the Bible come alive. And I impress upon anybody that if they have the opportunity to go to Israel, uh, to, to walk the, the places that Christ walked, and it makes your Bible study come alive when you can see that this, these, these places are real, and Jesus literally spoke and taught at these particular places. And magnificent. Verse 2, immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, nor even near the door, and he preached the word to them. So Jesus is preaching the word from the, from the Old Testament, who he, he, who he is, um, and the crowds obviously, obviously came in because they knew that this, this man was more than a rabbi. They knew this man had just unbelievable knowledge of the word. And little did they know that he is indeed the author of the word. He is indeed the living word. When Jesus comes back in the book of Revelation, he comes back as the title of the living word. He is the word of God. And John 1.1, 1, 1, we see that he was in the beginning before the world. And he was with God. The word was God. Okay, verse uh, 3, and then he came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Four is always a number in expositional constancy, a fancy way that the Holy Spirit is always consistent in symbols, its idioms, and the numbers. Number four is always a symbol of the world. So Jesus is showing the world what he's going to do with this paralytic, okay? Verse 4, and when they came, could not come near him because of the crowd, and, and, and they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Okay, so in Israel, in this particular time and still Israel today, you have um, the top of someone's house is really the place that you go where the sun comes down and where it gets cooler. That was your entertainment place. So every uh, house had a roof. And that's why when we get to the point of the prophetic, when we did in Matthew 24, and we get into the prophetic of uh, in Mark, Jesus will say, you know, when you're on the top, house, uh, the top of your house, don't look back. Uh, just go. Don't look for your baggage. Just go. Head to Petra. And we'll get more into that when we get that part of the, uh, the, the gospel of Mark. But um, it, so the top of the top of the roof, and so this, this, this man, these men had such great faith and this paralytic had such great faith that they were cutting a hole to let this man down on his bed so that he could get to Jesus because the crowd overwhelmed him around on the ground. When Jesus saw their faith, faith he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you, which creates a huge stir because only God can, can uh, forgive sins. And so this is going to get their dandruff up. 
Some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Okay, here's the key to this. They were reasoning in their hearts. They never spoke anything. This is where you show that Jesus supernaturally, not only the Son of God, God in the second head and the Son of Man, or considered the second Adam who will come and, and be the redeemer of the sin once and for all because of his, salve, of, because of his crucifixion on the cross for our sins. Um, he's, uh, they're reasoning in their heart. So he's reading their mind and reading their heart. So God, the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, they know the intent of our heart always. We don't need to speak it. Remember when Sarah was come up by Jesus, which is called a thanopony. A thanopony is an Old Testament uh, revelation of Jesus Christ in the flesh before his earthly birth. So when he came up with the two angels before they went to Sodom and Gomorrah, they looked on and, and said, Sarah would be, uh, would, be, would, would be with child, and that would be Isaac at, a, at an old age. And she laughed inside. She didn't laugh outwardly, but Jesus knew she laughed. And that's why... Um, and she says, I didn't, I didn't laugh. And she you know, technically wasn't lying. She didn't outwardly laugh, but she laughed in her heart thinking, how in the heck am I going to have a son when I'm 90 years old? It's impossible, but no, nothing is impossible for God. And the name Isaac, who she gave birth to, to be the covenant from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Isaac means in Hebrew, laughing boy, because Sarah, or S Sarah laughed. And this is what these uh, scribes and Pharisees are doing. They're laughing in their heart. They're like, who is this guy He's saying he can forgive sins? So, what, uh, so why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? In the Greek, theos, three, God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. Verse eight, but immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit, again, he perceived it. He didn't hear it. He perceived because he is uh, the son of God and God in the second head. He knew what they were thinking. He perceived it. Um, that their spirit, and he reasoned thus with himself. He said to them, why do you reason about these things in your heart? Why are you, why are you coming up with all this nonsense? You have that much time on your hand in this theology. You're missing theology. You're, you're, religious, you're religiously puffing yourself up and thinking you know the laws and the precepts and the commandments of God, but you missed the most important thing. It's a relationship, a relationship with a heart. God wants our heart. And he says that even in the Old Testament to Jeremiah. He says, circumcise their heart. I don't want your sacrifices. I don't want your offerings. I want your heart. And that's what Jesus is saying to him. You're missing it. It's not intellectual reading the Bible. It is a love relationship by opening up your heart to the Most High God through the Son, Jesus Christ. Praise his name. All right, but, uh, but that you may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic. So, um, I skip nine. I'm sorry, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or say, arise, take your bed and walk. So he's making a point. He says, what is easier for me to do to, to, to uh, show you? It would be easy for me to say, I am the son of God, and uh, your sins are forgiven, because only God could justify that. He would have to strike him down with, 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 with fire. But, he, but look at what I'm doing. I'm saying I'm the son of God and I'm brought down by God and forgive him, forgive this paralytic of his sins and take your mat and walk away. This is a pure miracle. He's getting up and walking away. Only God can do miracles. Thus far, I am from the father and the father is me and I am him. We create one and, and three. Theos in the Greek, Elohim, the three and the Hebrew. So, but you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic. So he's saying that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has authority. The Father gave him authority to forgive sins. Jesus cannot do anything unless the Father gives him authority, and the Father has given him authority. Immediately he rose, took up his bed, and went up in the presence of, all, of them all, so that they all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. So this was a quite an event. They've never seen a miracle of this magnitude. Uh, the Pharisees were blown away. And the key thing here is, what did the paralytic do? He gave praise to Theos. He gave praise to the Most High God. And everything done in a true miracle gives glory to God, God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
the Satan will never give glory to God. He will never give glory to Jesus Christ, and he will never give glory to the Holy Spirit. Satan is in it for himself. Satan is, wants you to take any other God except anything that comes through the Son, Jesus Christ. The only thing that he is just totally against is Jesus Christ. So that is an important thing that after this a, a miracle happened, the paralytic gave praise to God. And that's what we need to do is walking and believing in the Lord. When we see miracles, when God is touching our heart, we give him glory, we give him praise. Praise to his name. Verse 13, then he went out again by the sea and all the multitudes came to him, he taught them. So we're seeing something very interesting that we mentioned many times in our Bible study. That when Jesus has a spiritual high, Jesus uh, had a miracle that everybody couldn't, could not believe that he got this paralytic to, to never walk. He got up to walk and he took his mat and he you know, went in to do, fulfill the law because once you were, you were healed, you'd have to go to the high priest, give your offerings. So you, Jesus was actually fulfilling the law after that. And um, so what does Jesus do after every spiritual high? He always escapes. He, he's escaping a boat by himself or he'll go up the top of a mountain by himself and he prays. He prays to God the Father because he's in an intercessor prayer, because that's when Satan attacks. He attacks when we're at our lowest point to try to destroy us, or he attacks at a spiritual high to say, no, that's not from God. That is not from God. He wants you to doubt. He wants you to doubt the Most High God through the Son, Jesus Christ. Praise his name. So that we need to look at Jesus. When we're at spiritual lows, seek the face of the Lord in prayer. And we're at spiritual highs, seek the face of the Lord in prayer. That's what Jesus is teaching us to do here. Uh, um, so then he went out by the sea, and, and uh, then he taught them. Verse 14, and he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of, of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. So this is Matthew. He wrote the book of Matthew. He was a tax collector, and these were considered the lowest of the lowest in the, in the Jewish tradition or in the, Jew, at the, in the time of Israel at this time because a tax collector would work to get taxes on behalf of the Roman government. So the, the, the Jewish people thought they were traitors and how they made their money, and they were kind of had an uh, unethical reputation, kind of like a... Uh, a a used car salesman or um, some realtors that we see today. Um, so he, 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 uh, um, he, he takes him and says, come follow me. And uh, what's he do? He does it right away. Um, so he, he, we get to verse 16. And when he and the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciple, how is that that he eats and drinks with tax, tax collectors and sinners? So they're judging Jesus because he's eating with the sinners. And uh, this is the problem where the church has gotten today. You know, 75% of all people who ever were surveyed why they left the church. And the reason is they were offended by someone or something in the church. And it's usually a, uh, a, uh, a spiritual pride from somebody within that church that rubbed them the wrong way or ran them out, thinking that they were mightier or better or more religious or better than anybody else. And Jesus is teaching us something very important here. We don't look upon anybody low. And just because you know the Bible better than somebody else and you are following God's word does not make you better than a sinner. God's love is for all mankind to confess their sins and come into the glory of the Lord. So the church today is not a museum for saints, no. It is a hospital for sinners, as Jesus says. They need a physician. And we as Christians, we want to bring people in to heal them because we all are fallen. We are all of SIN positive of our DNA and we all fall short of the glory of the Lord and it's only by the grace, the free gift of our beloved Savior, Jesus Christ, that gives us this everlasting life. So we need to be that light in the darkness and bring them in and love. Bring in the sinners and let them, let them love. And somebody who thinks they're intellectually better than somebody else in theology they're doing it with their mind instead of their heart. They need to be humbled. Remember, it says, he who is exalted will be humbled. The humbled will be exalted. God is looking for somebody with a humbleness that serves as humble. You cannot be exalted if you're serving the Lord truly with your heart because it's not about you anymore. You've left self and gave everything up to the Most High God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise his name. When Jesus said, he said to them, those who are well do not need a physician, but those who are sick. 
I did not call on the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. And so he's saying, I didn't call on the righteous. I'm coming to get the sinners. I was brought to the earth to pay the price, to tell us die, paid in full for every single person who ever born has fallen short because of Adam and Eve and Lucifer being thrown out of God's, uh, God's heaven because of pride. And first of all, they are not righteous. It's a credit to righteousness by your faith, and they don't have faith. Faith comes from love. So Jesus is calling them out. They think they're righteous, but truly they're not. Righteousness is not something that we can earn. Righteousness is built on our faith, and faith is built on our love and our trust in the Most High God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Remember the scripture says, it was a credit to Abraham as righteous by his faith, not his sacrifices, not his circumcision. Abraham trusted God. Therefore, he had faith. And that's what made him righteous. And that is a free gift. And that comes from us giving all of ourselves up to him and for him. The disciples and John and the Pharisees were fasting. And they came and said to him, Why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast? But you are, your disciples do not fast. So they're, they're putting on these fasts. Remember, we see in the other Gospels that they would come in and make themselves look pale and say, oh, we're so holy, we're fasting for three days, look at me in these, these clothes and I'm better than everybody else, look at me, I'm fasting and I'm praying that I don't want to be like this sinner and this tax collector because I'm more mightier, because spiritually I'm higher than them. He, Jesus is calling them out. You know, you can, you can have those types of prayers all day long, but if your heart is not true to God, God knows the heart. And it's not these long-winded prayers. It is not us exalting ourselves, thinking that we're obeying something and being righteous. No, righteousness comes from faith. Faith comes from, from the free gift. And faith is all about trusting the Lord with love. And that's what Jesus is trying to tell them. And they are getting it wrong. And Jesus said, can the friends of the bridegroom fast with the bridegroom is with them? As long as the bridegroom is with them, they cannot fast. So Jesus called himself the bridegroom. And Jesus will come back to marry the church. The church is the bride. And it's everything is in, the, in, in heaven and throughout the Bible is called a wedding, a wedding ceremony. God the Father talked about marrying to Israel, how they, how they were a, a, a harlot, how they committed adultery against the Lord because they turned to other gods. Then Jesus Christ is the bridegroom. He will come down and get his bride, which is the church. And once we're caught up with the bridegroom to the church, we'll have the wedding ceremony. And the wedding ceremony is a beautiful ceremony that God brings us all together through his son, Jesus Christ, and welcome us in to the kingdom of heaven, and we rejoice. For that particular time, there's no need for fasting. You, don't, you fast in your prayer because of God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. He's saying, I am Jesus Christ, the Son of God, with you. Why would you fast? When I leave, that's when you fast. When I leave the comforter with you, then you fast for your particular prayers and do it with a, with, with, a, with a heart of love, not a heart of judgment. And that's what the church needs to do. More love, less judgment, and more to the scripture, being obedient to the word and putting God first, Jesus Christ first, the Holy Spirit first, and us last. That is the walk of our sanctification. When we can give up self for his glory, that starts our walk, praise his name. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and they will fast in those days. So he's talking about when he is, uh, he's resurrected, he dies on the cross for our sins, past, present, future, and then he's resurrected to be our high priest. That's the time of fasting. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old, and the tear is made worse. So he's saying, He's going to come back and create all, all things new. So you don't take a new piece of, 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 of patch, he says, on an old garment. He says, I am the new covenant that was spoke about in Jeremiah 31, 31. The Lord said to Jeremiah, I will give my people a new covenant, referring to the Christ. And with Jesus, all things are new once we have been born again and accept him as Lord and Savior. That's why he's telling us in this parable. He says, no one puts new wine in old wine skin. If you put the new wine in old wine skin, it's, it's all bloated out. It will, it will seep. So he's saying, I create all things new. Don't take the old and mesh with the new. It is all new through me. I am 
the Son of God, and I am God and the second head. Or else the new wine bursts in the wineskin. The wine is spoiled and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. And that's exactly what you do in those days. You take new wine and you put it into new wineskin. Because the new wine or the new wine skin, what happens with wine, it ferments. And as it ferments, it grows with the new wine. And if you did that with old wine wine skin, it would leak out. So he's telling us a practical purpose, and he's telling us a spiritual purpose that he is the completion. All ways are new through him. Narrow is the gate, but he is the shepherd gate. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And all things that are old, that's why baptism is so important. It is the immersion of sins being washed away, being born again. We're new creation. And, and through Jesus Christ, he's saying, that's why you need to have the new, because you're, I'm giving you a new covenant, and I'm giving you new eternal life. Verse 23, now it happened that they went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and they went his disciples began to pluck the, the heads of the grain, and they weren't supposed to do this um, for two reasons. They weren't supposed to, unless they were doing the corners of the, uh, of the, of the harvest. What is said in the Torah is uh, the, the, the gleaning. Um, we mentioned that in one of our other studies. It's in the book of Ruth. So if you own the land, you're supposed to take the four corners of your land and not, and not harvest those. Those were for the poor and the elder, the people that needed that. And once you did your harvest, you going through, you weren't go, you're not so, so supposed to go back and glean. You leave whatever you couldn't pick up the first time for the poor behind. And uh, that's what Jesus is talking about. This is not their field, so they're breaking a commandment and most importantly, talking about the Sabbath working on the Sabbath. And they take the Sabbath so uh, intently. Um, when I was uh, in Israel uh, a while back, I was at the King David Hotel, and my hotel, my hotel room was on one of the top, top floors, and I made the horrible mistake. It was on a Shabbat. And uh, there's two types of elevators. There's a regular elevator that's for secular that goes up and down like a regular elevator, and then there is a Shabbat elevator. And the, the Jewish people believe that by pushing a button on an elevator on a Sabbath is work. So this elevator goes and stops at every single floor. And that's literally the way it is today. And it took me hours to get to my floor. And uh, next time I go to Israel, I will know the difference on a Shabbat. But this is how they take uh, legalism and, and the Sabbath uh, completely out of context. And Jesus is going to show them what is the purpose of the Sabbath. God created the Sabbath for a reason. And let's show that. Uh, look what they did is not lawful on the Sabbath. Verse 25. But he said to them, Have you ever never read that what David did when he was hungry and he and those with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priests, and also gave some to those who were with him. He's referring back to David, which David was uh, on the run. And... Um, he was on run, the run from King Saul. Yes, he was anointed to be the next uh, king of Israel, but he was not yet. And he went and got some of the, uh, some of the bread because it, it was, it, he was nourished. He needs that nourishment. And the Lord accepted that because God's purpose is, was, was, was farther ahead for that. And, and, and normally uh, that was something that you would be struck down for in the, in the covenant. Uh, but David was allowed to do that because God had an everlasting covenant with King David. David had uh, work to do for the Lord, and that was a way of sustaining him. As a, so a Sabbath was made for, for man, not the other way around. And Jesus is showing this. In verse 27, he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man. And God knows, uh, and that's why on the seventh day he said to rest. God doesn't need to rest, and he creates the Sabbath. Remember on the Hebrew calendar, the, the seventh day is a Saturday. That's the Shabbat. And he says it's for man that they need to, to meditate, to focus on me and rest their physical and their spiritual bodies so that they can regenerate themselves. That's why God created the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, is what Jesus is saying, and not man for the Sabbath in 27. And we'll close out in verse 28. Therefore, the Son of Man is also the Lord of the Sabbath. So he's saying the Son of Man, Son of God, Jesus Christ, through the lion of the tribe of Judah and the, and the root of David, is the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was created, and, and Jesus Christ is the Lord of it. And that's why Jesus picks the Sabbath to show them uh, so many times in doing miracles. We pray that Mark 2 has been a blessing to you. And may the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob bless you. Till next time in Mark 3. God bless you.